Thank you for joining us on Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And each week we have an opportunity to explore the fascinating stories of the city of Mississauga. This week's episode features part two of our interview with Tom Urbaniak on the life and times of Hazel McCallion. So going forward from there, I mean, we, you know, arguably the, the biggest increase in terms of development that Mississauga has seen outside of the big three uh, with, with uh, the Meadowvale era mills and city center developments, Bruce McLaughlin, uh, SB, uh, SB McLaughlin, uh, Peter Langer's group, and uh, um, uh, the Muzo family with their mill development. I mean, they, of course, shaped that idea of this, these emerging suburban communities. But, uh, you know, myself, when I look back on the 1980s and think of the massive increase in population, the massive building increase under Hazel's direction, I mean, how does she maintain that popular support in a municipality that has, is growing exponentially? No, no, great, great question. And it's, it's fascinating, too, because the mantra of Streetsville town of Streetsville had been slow. The mantra of the Martin Dobkin administration uh, with Hazel McCallion as a key ally of Dobkin was slow growth. Right? And then in the 1980s, we see rapid growth. Um, and yet we see rapid growth in a way that does not seriously harm the political prospects of, of Hazel McCallion. And so that is a really interesting question. Uh, so part of it is the tenor of the time. Uh, the, the, in the 1980s, we see neoconservative movements in many places. We uh, see a kind of um, narrative that is very favorable to business and not so favorable to government. In the 1980s, Hazel McCallion would often say, I run this city like a business. Uh, by the early 2000s, she wasn't saying that anymore. She was admitting, no, no, city is not a business. Public administration is not a business. The public interest is not necessarily the private interest. But in the 1980s, I run this city like a business. Uh, and then there was a key, key moment in the city's development. And these are a series of decisions made in late 1981, 1982, around the long-term plan of the city, where the city would grow in the future that essentially opened up most of the remaining greenfield sites in the city development. Uh, that's not what Martin Dobkin wanted. Uh, Martin Dobkin, under the slow growth, and progressive neighborhood mantra was saying, well, we'll do infill development, we'll do contiguous development, so we'll gradually open up uh, land for development in a way that's connected to the existing city. And here you have this decision by council with the mayor strongly in favor, strongly deputy, to actually open up the canvas um, to develop with a critical condition that there would be a steep price of admission. So if you are one of these big development companies, uh, you can be green lighted to build, create neighborhoods in areas that are not contiguous, not attached to existing neighborhoods or existing services. But you have to make sure you put the required services in and beyond that, a, a series of development charges to the city that will allow the city to develop or replace services that impact not only the new neighborhoods, but the existing neighborhoods of the city. Uh, and this was not permitted in provincial legislation at the time. Uh, there was no Development Charges Act until 1991, which took its inspiration to some degree from Mississauga. But the way the city did this is it sort of it used a bargaining chip. It said, we, well, we simply don't have the capacity to even talk to you, big developers, unless you acknowledge and agree in a covenant that you will pay these development charges to the city. So the developers essentially contractually agreed to do what the city wanted them to do, rather than the city using some sort of authority that the province had bestowed on municipalities to force them to do it. So that was a key decision. It contributed to very rapid growth in the city, but 
most of that growth was not in people's backyards. It was not infill, it was greenfield. And I actually looked carefully at the statutory hearings, like the required hearings of the Planning and Development Committee have to happen at the critical stages of this development. And a lot of these huge developments were being approved without even one citizen appearing in the council chambers to address the council with some concern, major or minor, with respect to the development. Why not? Because it was not in their backyard. Right. You propose a, um, a fourplex in, uh, you know, just outside Port Credit, uh, and you might fill the council chambers. Uh, propose the future Churchill Meadows community, future population 55,000, you might not get one person in the council chambers to express concern about that. So an interesting formula, rapid development, development charges, people are seeing improvements in their services, the revenues are coming in for a while, um, taxes can be held steady, even decreased as happened starting in 1993, um, and it looks like, you know, and it sucks, and it was uh, a city that uh, was uh, more than holding its own. Is it, a, is it a formula for the long-term administration of a mature urban area? Of course not. And of course, Ed Hazel McCallion herself acknowledged that eventually. Yeah, it was, it was a, the, kind of an interim plan of the, I, I believe uh, I, I heard one presenter that talked about this being uh, the, the, the teenager coming of year, coming of age. Uh, and you know it's it's not the adult plan yet, but it's uh, it's you know it's charting the path forwards to get to there, so so to speak. Uh, it, th those are uh, what we refer to, I guess, as the development levies, right? The the those the that's the development levy. Um, and and but through this, I mean, you have this this building that's taking place. Our population is skyrocketing um, in in comparative terms. Um, you have a, a drastic increase of people that are new to Mississauga. Um, uh, new to life under Hazel McCallion, uh, and yet this mayor continues to have that popularity, um, and and it's 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 astounding to see. And uh, you know, I, I I'm I'm a citizen of the city, and I, I I've lived through those terms that that time, and uh, it's hard to argue against the popularity of Hazel um, uh, at the time, as as pretty much anyone who ran against her found out as well. But uh, well, how do you how do you interpret that? What what what, what what kept the Hazel as the forefront of, of the municipal mindset? So uh, yes, Hazel stepped into a leadership vacuum. Uh, yes, there were some sort of critical decisions along the road that created a formula for you know, potentially popular and stable local leadership. But let's not discount how she took advantage of those variables with her style of leadership. Uh, and and we, I use the term populist. It is a bit of a populist style, but it's an accessible style of leadership as well. So Hazel would make sure that she would, well, you know, try to be in five places at once, uh, you know, do multiple events uh, every day. Um, she would usually work a 14 or 15 hour day, uh, spending a lot of the time you know, dropping in on her citizens whether it's a ribbon cutting for a small business or a puck drop or the start of a, a hockey tournament or shopping at a different grocery store every week, which she did intentionally in order to be, in order just to have some sort of interaction with a maximum number of constituents. Uh, she would insist that any staff of the city uh, stay back. Uh, so she would usually travel alone to the different events and, and venues. There wouldn't be handlers, there wouldn't be uh, like a press secretary or an executive assistant, but you would never see the executive assistant. The executive assistant was back in the mayor's office while Hazel drove herself around in her uh, vehicle with the license plate Mayor One. So oh, and, even yeah. if you didn't actually see the mayor, you knew she was on site. Uh, and that was powerful stuff. Um, you would go anywhere in Mississauga and people would usually claim to have had a hazel sighting. Uh, and in a city as large as Mississauga became, that in many ways was, was very impressive. And it came across as frugal as well. Even though hazel eventually became the best paid mayor in Canada, um, she had this you know, image of frugality. Again, she's driving herself around. 
the, the, the staff on surrounding her, the staff in the mayor's office was always very small. And that's because she could rely on the city administration to kind of do what needed to be done rather than protecting herself from the city administration with a large political uh, staff. Um, she would make jokes like, uh, he, I'd like to recognize these citizen volunteers. Here's a certificate. Um, sorry, I couldn't frame it because I spend the public's money the, the way I spend my own, which is seldom. Oh, no. <laughs> and, yeah. and people love this. It, it really went over well. I, I, and that personality uh, you know, preceded her and, and people like you said, they flocked to the, the sighting of the mayor, uh, and uh, she, she had that. Uh, uh, I, I just I'm going through my head of like Canada days, where she stands up at the at the, at the crowd, and you know Canada is the best country in the world, and Mississauga is the best city in Canada, you know, and she really pumps you up to be proud of the place that you live, um, and and to feel attachment to it, and part of that is through her personality and how she conveys the message, and and I think. There's a there's a, a dynamism to that, and, right. and it must have been so hard for someone to even contemplate running against. Right, and, and think about how important or how powerful that is um, in a city where a very significant proportion of people are uh, newcomers, including newcomers to Canada, um, where you know, you don't have. Um, a, a sort of a brand that really precedes uh, Hazel McCallie. She kind of became the brand of, of the city, yes. uh, almost more recognizable than, than the city itself, the historic landmark of, of Mississauga. Actually, she would, and you know, know this well through your work with Heritage Mississauga, she would sometimes joke that the places that are being designated uh, as having heritage significance are younger than she is. Um, and so she was the, you know, the landmark of the city for many years and still, even in retirement. Very, very much so that, that you connect the city to the person, even if you don't know much about Hazel the politician, uh, Hazel the face becomes the symbol of the city in, in many, many ways. And I, I think that's fascinating to look, to look at and to see that part that personality come through over the years. One of the things we did with this program, and, and I've got a couple of things we can come back to in, in our conversation, but we, we threw this out here to the audience to, uh, to send in some questions. And we received a couple of questions and some of them we've touched on, but um, one of them was, uh, uh, what was the most challenging situation that Hazel ever dealt with? And we have touched on the train derailment. I don't know if that's an obvious answer, but I, I throw it out there to you. And is, is there other ones, including the train derailment that come to mind? Yeah, I think the most challenging or perhaps most difficult moments in her political career were the two conflict of interest episodes. Uh, so uh, in 1982, um, she had to defend herself against conflict of interest accusations in court. And then starting in 2009, uh, at the request of the majority of city council, the initial inquiry was convened to look at uh, allegations that the mayor had used her public office to erect the pension funds that owned the last best piece of land in the city center, that land to a company controlled by the mayor's son, which he had helped form uh, for the purpose of developing a hotel convention center and condominium units. Um, these were, uh, these were in a, in a political, like, these were near political death experiences. Uh, Hazel McCallion, both of them. So in uh, 1982, the, the situation involved the mayor participating in discussion and voting on a motion to release for secondary planning, um, in other words, for development, uh, for sort of imminent development, uh, a, a large tract of land that included, it wasn't the only part of the, this tract of land, but it included her family's five acre. And uh, Jack Graham, her former ally on the Streetsville Council, uh, who turned political enemy, uh, was the one who brought the uh, claim. Because at that time, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act required a citizen to initiate the uh, judicial process. Uh, so Jack Graham did. And the court found that. Uh, Hazel McCallion was in conflict of interest, 
that she should have declared what you do, like if you have a personal financial interest in a matter before city council, you declare that interest, you refrain from discussion and voting, and you refrain from trying to influence the vote. So she had done all of that. She had, um, discussed and voted on the matter. She uh, tried to influence the vote. She strongly criticized the one council who opposed releasing that land for development, Larry Taylor. Um, so the judge found that there was a problem here, but that it was a bona fide error in judgment. And that was crucial because had the judge not attached that proviso, the act at the time would have required him to declare her seat vacant, to remove her as mayor. That was a really close call. Um, and then of course, 2009 and years subsequent, uh, that was that was a messy time because the city council had turned against the mayor, which was like almost unheard of uh, before that. They really believed the count the majority that there was something there, um, and then you know seven million dollars later, this judicial inquiry was found what there was, but maybe again um, error in judgment uh, and shouldn't have happened, and we've got to update the ethical uh, infrastructure. Would have been worse. In both instances, she declared basically total there. Um, there wasn't really a lot of contrition there. Um, and it could have been more problematic for Hazel. Let's say in a, large, in a, in a different urban context uh, where there's a, more of a, um, a critical media, uh, sort of more of an established opposition, uh, they might have blown this up into something really, really serious, maybe politically fatal. Um, so she didn't handle it superbly, um, and I would, and it, it wasn't the most, these weren't the most flattering moments in her political career. I'd probably say that those were, the, those were the difficult and challenging episodes ahead of the others. Um, what, we've talked about so many things that make, that made Hazel's career what it was and how people view Hazel, and, and those darker moments that are the two conflicts of interest aside, what made her so successful? That's another question we had. So what, what made Hazel so successful in Mississauga? Uh, we've talked about personality. We've talked about uh, kind of the timing of, of uh, her rise in, into, into uh, being mayor, the train derailment setting the stage. Uh, and it, it's hard to, I think, pick out a, a moment, but what, what do you think in an answer to a question like that? What, what made her so successful? Yeah, I think the fact that she had uh, business and management experience, um, was was helpful to her uh, because sometimes people sometimes politicians have a bit of a populist personality um, and, but not a, an understanding of the business administration uh, can sort of really find themselves uh, outing ideas or notions that just are completely unworkable from an administrative perspective so she always had that administrative pragmatism even while she had the populist personality. I think that was that was something that that helped her for sure. Um, the unvarnished communication, um, the sort of instinctive understanding that uh, the, the public will forgive gaps if they see you as just talking directly to them, uh, which other politicians were very have been slow to realize. Uh, they sort of prefer to be tightly scripted, to take only one or two questions, and then you run out of the room. Uh, Hazel McCallion didn't have that, that, that approach. Uh, and then she had this, this uncanny ability to, and this may be from being in five places at once, circulating everywhere, to feel the public pulse better than any opinion, than any scientific opinion. She could sense these subtle changes in the public mood. And because of her pragmatism, like she was never really an ideologue. She didn't have a core, core philosophy that always animated her throughout her life. Um, so because of that pragmatism, she could, she could also change with the mood, uh, but in a way that wasn't behind the mood, but a little bit ahead of it. Um, so we talked about you know, the 1980s, the, the time that, uh, you know, in the popular narrative, the private sector business was looked upon highly. She reflected that. Late 1990s, early 2000s, public mood is shifting. They're more green, environmental, 
um, less sort of favorable to these business tycoons. I shifted in time with lots of time to spare actually and became a great champion of smart growth, um, public transit, infill development. Uh, she was not talking about those things in the 1980s to a great extent, but by the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, no longer talking about tax reduction. So 80s, early 90s, this was a time when the popular mood was very much against taxing. Reflected that. Uh, by the late 90s into the 2000s, uh, much less so. And she actually even admitted, well, maybe we made a mistake reducing taxes when we did. Maybe we should have put away for a rainy day because that infrastructure is coming to you for repair and replacement and the development charges will soon be going down. Um, she realized that the, uh, she couldn't use the mantra, you know, we run a debt-free city because the city wouldn't be debt-free for much longer. Um, so this ability to feel the public mood and to put words around before the public itself has been able to coalesce or organize or agitate for a new way of being. Um, so she was a mayor for different seasons, so to speak. And that's, that's a remarkable part of the Hazel story. That, that's a wonderful way to put it, actually. I was trying to come up with a, a term that, 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 that encapsulated that. In, in my head, I've always, personally, I've always looked at uh, Hazel as a personality as kind of the, the small town mayor running a big city that everyone knew her, everyone believed they knew her, everybody could converse with her. When they when she spoke, she felt like she was talking to you. Um, it, 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 it's it's a remarkable trait because yeah, I don't I don't see that a lot in in uh, kind of the major political players we see on news today and, and whatnot. Where there's almost a folksiness, whether it was uh, on purpose or not, but there's almost a folksiness to Hazel's approach. Um, but obviously, that pragmatism that overrides it all is, is quite quite uh, a strength of hers. A little bit, she was a little bit less approachable when it came to um, those people who had critiqued her policies in public. Um, she didn't take too kindly to that. Uh, and I, actually, she said on several occasions that um, organizations or advocates um, or accounts, for that matter, who have concerns with some of her statements or policies um, should, well, sort of, shouldn't, are kind of irresponsible by just expressing those in public. Now, another argument is that a healthy democracy almost requires that, that, that the public be able to see uh, these, these alternatives. Um, she also had the notion that once a decision is taken, um, that sort of affiliated organizations or even unaffiliated organizations with the city or, and the council for sure, um, they almost have a responsibility to unite behind Right. The decision. Um, again, you could argue, well, in a healthy democracy, well, no, there, there is a role for that opposition voice. Uh, and she wasn't too, too patient with that idea in, for most of her time as mayor. Right. One of the other questions we had, and it made me smile when we received this one, was why do we love her? <laughs> why did Mrs. Hoggins love Hazel so much? And I think we've touched on a lot of that. Is it, and to me, it, it can be even a simple answer in terms of the the personality and that approachability that she conveyed and the way she spoke. But if, if someone were to ask you that, why do Mrs. Hoggins love Hazel so much? Yes, so it was uh, 1985, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Rick Drennan was then the sports editor for the Mississauga News. And I guess someone got the idea that he should run for mayor. So he ran for mayor in 1985 uh, and Late in the campaign, he realized he didn't have much of a chance. Uh, in fact, he predicted he would lose soundly. And uh, he explained it this way. It's like running against everyone's favorite grandmother. Okay? And it's an awkward way of putting it. Um, but let's just think about that for a moment. It's the, 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 the connection that many Mississaugans had and have to Hazel McCallion is almost familial. Um, it's almost like she is part of our extended family. Um, and is that because of her visibility, uh, her presence, the kind of stability she, she brought, um, the 
feeling of reassuredness. Actually, Hazel would often say in her cable television program and other venues, the citizens of Mississauga can rest assured that the blanks, the people were sure. Um, I remember serving as a judge once for an essay contest. And the submissions were from grade three students. And one of the submissions was, I have been to City Hall with my class. Our mayor has everything under control. I thought the, you know, those two sentences say a lot about people's perception of the, the matriarch of the city um, with whom they feel an emotional uh, bond. Uh, it is a remarkable phenomenon. It's, it's, it goes even beyond study by political scientists. It's, it, it almost requires a little bit of a psychological analysis, yeah. which is really, really, uh, really, really fascinating. Um, and similar to a member of our extended family, we are often sort of quick to forgive um, if sort of awkward comments or, um, or gaffes or outbursts. Uh, and the citizens of Mississauga uh, were forgiving of, of Hazel McCallion. That's not taking away from my acknowledgement of her uh, remarkable and unusual quality. Uh, but she also benefited from a forgiving public. When you look at, you know, we're not necessarily in the, the business of prognostication, but um, Hazel is approaching an incredible milestone, turning 100 years old and uh, a life led in service and, and, and in giving to her the communities in which she lives, obviously, and, and uh, less has created this mark on Mississauga that will forever bear her fingerprints on it. Um, when we look at what will be the legacy of, of, of Hazel, um, how, how, would you, how would you see the legacy of Hazel on the city we call home today? Yeah, I think the legacy of Hazel McCallion will be less associated with a particular project or a particular public service uh, or even a particular vision uh, for the city. I think it, it, would, it would be the person of Hazel McCallum, that's the legacy. Some of these things we've just talked about, um, a style of politics that is uh, retail and, and accessible, a matter of fact and clear way of communicating, uh, a, a decisiveness and a, and a personality, just, some leaders don't have a personality, we don't see it. Um, but here's a leader who has a personality and that's what made her very relatable. A poster person for healthy aging, all of those things will, uh, uh, will be part of the, the Hazel McCallion legacy for sure. Um, in terms of the actual development of the city, uh, even though in recent years, I think more of us have been giving thought to how the city developed, how it could have developed, um, how it ought to still develop, uh, I think the jury will be out for some time um, about sort of how uh, sustainable and functional Mississauga is or, or can be, uh, and how some, some of the problems that Hazel Kelly herself has acknowledged that maybe the city was too slow on, on public transit. Maybe it sprawled too, too quickly at first without the more careful neighborhood-based approach. Um, whether that can be corrected over time as the city is certainly uh, trying to do. Uh, so yeah, um, she definitely will leave uh, a powerful uh, legacy. Um, and it will be, even though Hazel McCallion is turning 100, I'm still interested to see what she does next um, because she's still a force in public life uh, with, with her comments and her endorsements uh, and her unpredictability. Right? She's not associated with one party or one politician. Um, so I still often look to what she might say to get a sense of where the public mood is shifting and uh, where some of the priorities might be in the future for politicians. Absolutely. You still see when Hazel comes out to an event or is standing up talking about something or whether it's a fundraising campaign or something like that, her voice carries a tremendous amount of weight. Um, you know, people have connected with her, continue to connect with her. Um, you know, here, here's a challenge for you. Uh, come back to your book, the, Her Worship and uh, Mayor McCallion 
uh, Hazel Battalion and the development of Mississauga. You know, maybe the challenge is, you know, 20 years from now as a retirement project, Tom, is to come back and look at, you know, the uh, when you wrote this book, Hazel was still in her, it would have been her final term of mayor. Uh, yeah, not quite yet even. Yeah, quite, she so, yeah. still had another term. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, look back at those, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to look back and the challenge I'll throw it out there, we'll, we'll reconvene in 20 years or so. And see, <laughs> uh, no, no, I'd like to do that. I would, yeah. So to, to look back and, and see how the city has uh, developed because, um, you know, development is a long-term process. Uh, it's not an overnight thing. The, the plans that are laid by sometimes previous administrations don't come to the fore until administrations down the road. And, and uh, uh, it'd be fascinating to see, you know, as myself a resident, I know yourself as a, a former resident with long ties and interest in the city to see how it develops and how our uh, looking back on the years of Hazel as the formative years of the city really kind of uh, have uh, coalesced and become part of this, this civic identity. It'll be fascinating to say. And maybe we can ask Hazel herself for her reflections, which we can be in 20 years. There we go. It just reminds me of a story. I, I remember, I think it was uh, maybe 1997, 98, and uh, I was um, a university student and I was working part-time uh, as a community journalist. And I remember we were at the opening of the River Grove Community Center and Hazel was there and a uh, few of the members of council were there. And we were sort of doing a tour of the community center. And at one point we came to a room where there was a program for, for, for children who were maybe four or five years old and their, their team leaders were there. Um, and Hazel sort of leapt ahead of everyone else who was on the tour. And she went and started talking to the, the, the children who were participating in this program. And I remember uh, counselor Katie Mahoney at the time uh, just turned to me and said, well, it's good she's doing that because they'll be voting for her one day. And the people who were around us heard this and, and laughed, right? They, well, they won't be. Well, you know, those, those children came of voting age when Hazel McCallion was still the mayor of Mississauga. Uh, so she's uh, certainly uh, outdone uh, any pro uh, predictions or prognostications. Absolutely. I remember doing a presentation early in my years of, uh, of city of uh, with Heritage Mississauga, probably early 2000s, and, uh, and talking about how the, the population growth of our city through the 80s into the 1990s and how the vast majority of our population had known but one mayor. And, and, and it's astounding to think when you look at those that, that increase of population and you still think it's one mayor from, uh, in this case, multiple generations of, of families come to know. My, my, I'm gonna date myself with this one, Tom, and uh, uh, my mother uh, was very proud of the fact that she campaigned for Hazel McCallion in 1978. Um, she, she was, uh, uh, she, at that point, my brother was less than a year old. Uh, he was born in 1977. And I was a, uh, a very, uh, I guess the word obnoxious or, or rambunctious ta uh, youngster. Uh, I was born in 73. And uh, my mother fell in a pothole while pushing a stroller. And I had the, uh, the joyous moment of standing there laughing at her. Uh, and uh, she broke her ankle. And uh, while campaigning for Hazel, and my mother still recounted that day that she had to call in to, uh, once she got home, she had to call and say she couldn't continue to, this is the reason why. And she said the road was paved two days later. <laughs> so you, you have these, these moments, and that's in 1978, like this is, this is early on. And, uh, um, but just a, a force and a, and a, you know, a civic memory of uh, maybe second to none in terms of memory of people and place and things that had happened. I think that, that did well for her, I, I, you know, many times hearing her talk and being able to recall these moments from the past and uh, these, these things, these milestones have been achieved. And it really did paint this picture of this individual in control, but this path that had been charted and these, these decisions that have helped make and create the city that we call home, regardless of when she was saying that. It, 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 was, it was a fascinating thing to watch and to see. For sure. Yeah. Well, I, I think... I, 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 You've been an amazing person to speak with in terms of this chart and this path that Hazel has been on. And uh, to all those interested in reading more, I, I cannot recommend 
more your book. I mean, that's something that really encourage anyone who's fascinated in the story of Mississauga and, and, and the story of Hazel Italian to, to pick up her worship um, and, uh, and have a read of, of kind of the, you might not look at the same story of Mississauga, you might not look at Mississauga the same way again. And that, that's a good thing. That's a good thing to analyze the place we call home. And thank you for spending uh, what has been uh, over the last hour with us. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, uh, just the exceptional poem and uh, the work that you've done in this and continue to do and the interest you have. Thank you for the, the passion and for the, uh, for offering us this, this, this chapter of our story as, as, as none have, uh, have done before you. And uh, um, really appreciate, really appreciate it. it. The respect is mutual, Matthew. Uh, keep up the excellent work and your colleagues at Heritage Mississauga. And I'm, uh, I'm proud to be a former volunteer, former board member of Heritage Mississauga. And uh, it's, it's something that had a, a significant and positive influence on me. So thank you, thank you so much. And likewise, really miss having you around the table. Sometimes when we have those conversations. I, I really enjoyed early in my career and early in yours when you were on the Heritage Mississauga Board of Directors, I really uh, felt that I, I learned a lot in how you handled yourself, but also how you explored the issues, particularly around heritage conservation, which is really not something that engaged in our conversation today, but something that becomes, you know, I, I'll put words in your mouth a little bit, but passionate to both of us um, in, in terms of that realm of conservation. And Mississauga has had its opportunities and challenges and misses over the years on, on those lines as well. But, uh, you know, from the heritage consciousness, perhaps Hazel is of the four. You said it's not the building; it's the you know the the the, the face, the person of Hazel that has become that hallmark of uh, of the preservation movement in a sense in Mississauga and that identity. So, thank you, Tom, very much. Really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Matthew. Thank you for joining us here on Ask a Historian. It's been our pleasure to welcome Professor Tom Urbaniak from Cape Breton University to share his knowledge in the life and times of Hazel McCallion, and in particular a reference to his book, Her Worship, Hazel McCallion and the Development of Mississauga. Also, we'd like to offer a hearty happy birthday, a happy 100th birthday to former Mississauga Mayor Hazel McCallion. Thank you for all that you've done for our city, and thank you again to Tom Urbanyuk for exploring the fascinating life and times of Hazel McCallion with us.